It's right up my street, it's my boulevard, it's right up my straza, oh my god, it's garden right up there, oh, it's right up my podcast. Ooh. Welcome to episode seven of Right Up My Podcast. My name's Kate White. And my name's Gwen Watson, and this is the podcast in which we talk to people about the myriad ways to make you feel good. And in this episode, we are going to be looking at how we can get better at getting shit done. Oh my goodness. This is, t- yeah. this is ringing all my bells and ticking all my boxes. Oh yes, this is definitely something that I need help with. As does every other friend I know <laughs> seems to need <laughs> some guidance with this. But before we get down and start talking about that in more detail, Gwen, tell me, what have you been doing in the last couple of weeks to make yourself feel good? Oh, God, I was really hoping we were going to go to you first because I (laughs) every time I'm like, what have I been doing? I tell you what's kind of made me feel good in a way. I've I've kind of been I've been kind of feeling really great. You know, I have real great days where I'm like, oh, I've been swimming or I've been, you know, I'm, I'm really in my flow at the moment. And the podcast is doing well and life is so tickety boo, everybody. And then the next day I'm like, ah, rage. (laughs) <laughs> and you're just annoyed with everybody. Actually, yeah. I saw this. I saw this video the other day. This Insta reel, which is where I spend most of my life. Hashtag procrastination. And this woman, and the, she's she's brilliant. She's like dancing, and it comes up. Um, who who has um, pissed you off today? And she's singing along to everybody, everybody, absolutely everybody. <laughs> you shared that with me, didn't you? That In so the good. whole wide world. I was like, girl, <laughs> that is how I am feeling. And um, anyway, I shared this with a couple of friends and they were going, it's so reassuring to hear you say that because one of them... Thelma, hello, Thelms, and her daughter, Hopsy, who listened to the podcast. Um, she was saying, you always seem to be, you know, she said, your job is now chasing the joy and you always seem to be experiencing joy. And is this, are you just showing off for the cameras or do you always feel that good? <laughs> and I was able to say, I don't always feel that good. Of course not. And yeah, um, yeah. and my friend, my other friend said she found it really reassuring because she had been thinking, God, Gwen seems to have reached enlightenment. And, um, <laughs> and then the next day I'm like, I'm really angry. I know. I love that. I love that. And it's always nice to know that someone yes. else has those dark moments. Yes. Definitely. And there's nothing like a bit of solidarity, is there, about knowing that other people ex- go through exactly the same peaks and troughs the same um, pendulum swing from joy to despair in a matter of minutes. That's just the the human state. Exactly. And that's the thing. That's what's made me feel good is, is opening up and sharing that means that other people share it back and, yes. and then you learn that everybody feels the same way and it's just I mean we know it don't we but it is yes. reassuring and and it is reassuring to have that reminder that everything will pass I think that's yes. the thing when we kind of go this will pass happiness joy anger sadness all of it will pass and all of it will be back again one day and that's all right and that's all right um, how about you Kate what have you been doing to make yourself feel good well kind of just to continue the theme of what you were chatting about I suppose I've been feeling increasingly uh, frustrated feeling like my wings have been clipped I think this is a um, a reaction to lockdown and the fact that I feel like I'm desperate to go on an adventure or even if it's a very small adventure, you know, to experience something new, go somewhere new, learn something new. Um, And that that's been really hard to do for everybody this year. So I've been feeling very sort of a a little growing knot of frustration in me. But actually this morning, um, some friends that I go swimming with over at the marine pool sent me a link to a open water (laughs) swimming challenge next September which me and some friends have signed up to and suddenly that has just given me a little fire in my belly again that excitement of knowing that I've got a challenge to train to because I am not a very strong swimmer I'm really not so this is going to be way out of my comfort zone um, and I think I'm going to have to have some swim coaching Rowan Clark, if you're listening, I'm going to be <laughs> tapping you up for a bit of swim coaching. Um, this is because amazing. It's open water. It's round a little island off South Devon coast near 
uh, near Big Brion Sea, I think the area of it's called Bantham, that kind of area of South Devon. Mm. And there's an island which in low tide has a sand bridge, but in high tide is fully um, encircled by the sea. So it's a swim around this island and it's about a mile, which I think in open water is not insignificant. Oh, no. I mean, swimming in waves, and it depends yeah. what the weather brings, doesn't it? Whether it's a mill pond or whether it's wavy, that could be this hard it. work, girl. It, I know. And it's in September, so the sea temperature shouldn't be too cold. But like you say, if it's a bad day, it's going to happen anyway, unless it really is crazy weather. <sighs> so I suddenly, that's made me feel really excited again. I just needed something to get the adrenaline flowing, I think. Although now I'm talking about it, I am a little bit scared. <laughs> you can do it, Kate. Yeah. You've got ages. And also it's something to look forward to, but also something you can work towards. Like you have to, so this will make you go to the pool. Exactly. This is what's exciting me, having a kind of a mission to uh, motivate me to move my body yeah. off the sofa. Yeah, good for you. I'm very, wow. very impressed. Come and do it too, Gwen. <laughs> oh, I'll come and watch you and I will be so proud of you. <laughs> I will cheer the loudest. Oh, it's right up my podcast. All right, what is this week's episode about, Kate? This episode, we are taking a look at procrastination, all those barriers that seem to um, appear between us actually doing the things that we want to do. And we talk to a very interesting lady called Fiona Powell, who is a change coach. And she works with people to works with people who are feeling stuck for whatever reason, um, for people who are feeling like they can't move their life forward. And a big part of that is self-sabotaging through things like procrastination and all those other things. So uh, we started our conversation with Fiona by asking her, what does procrastination actually mean? Oh, that's a fantastic question to start us off on. So I'm going to start with what is procrastination when I do it. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's when you know you should do something, you know you need to do something, and you don't. You put it off. You let it hang around you like a really heavy weight, because often it's something quite important. We tend to make the thing, whatever it is we're procrastinating about, way bigger and way you know more of a deal than it actually is, magnifying that pressure. And it just makes us feel heavy, slow, and at the same time, a little bit of a feeling of relief and escapism that we're somehow not doing the thing we're meant to be doing. Mm. Um, yes. I don't know if you've come across Tim Urban. He's done a yeah. he's done a brilliant TED talk, and I'd urge anybody to go and listen to it because it's absolutely hilarious. And he talks about the place where we are when we're procrastinating as the dark playground. A bit like there's a dark internet. Mm. Oh God! The dark playground <laughs> is a place where we can play, but it's tinged with guilt. Oh. It's tinged with this heavy, nasty oh. feeling of. Okay, I'm having a lot of fun cleaning the oven, but I should be writing an essay. I know this playground well. I have <gasps> oh a season God. pass. <laughs> I think I spend like 80% 80 of my time there. I, it's so familiar to me. <laughs> oh, my you, God. You just say dark playground and it makes sense. And it's such a tempting place for us to hang out. And oh. a lot of us learnt how to hang out there when we were very little. Oh, right. really? Because we learnt this stuff at school when we were avoiding homework when we were told to tidy our rooms and found something else to play with. So it's a really familiar, comforting place to be, the dark playground. And it is dark. Yes. Yes. So sinister sounding. Well, and because you can't really be present and enjoying it because you've no. got this thing weighing on your psychic to-do list. So you know you shouldn't be playing. Oh, my God. Is this a common thing? Are there a lot of us vying for space in the dark playground? Or I think I think almost all of us do. Um there is this sort of idea that some of us are procrastinators and some of us are not. Yes, I know some people have a, have a much better um, set of mechanisms to get themselves to do stuff. But all of us have experienced procrastination. Mm. Some of us are chronic, you know, so it's what, what can we do? I, I guess it falls into two camps. There's the idea of managing procrastination, uh, which Tim talks about. So Tim's um, TED Talk, it's very funny. Uh, he talks about managing your procrastination. 
Often our procrastination is managed for us when we have externally driven deadlines. Right. Okay. So if we always had external deadlines that we had to meet, we'd somehow always manage to do the stuff in our life that we need to do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Even if that involves pulling all nighters and you know <laughs> leaving things till the last minute, we somehow get the thing done. What really then becomes a problem when we often become adults or have our own projects or businesses that we're working on is when we don't have those externally imposed deadlines. There is no mechanism other than ourselves. And that's where things get really tricky. So there are things that we can do to manage procrastination, but there are also things that we can do to drop down a couple of levels below it and try and expose and collapse it. Oh, so, yeah. I presume like you were saying procrastination for you is so is it different for everybody like does it manifest in different ways for different people let me think about clients I've worked with I I don't think so I think it's pretty universal yeah yeah we may have learnt it in different places we may be playing it out in different parts of our lives you know there are people who procrastinate about taking exercise (laughs) <laughs> that's not something I've ever had a problem with. So sometimes it can be contextual. Yeah. Mm. You know, one person might be procrastinating over going for a run, but they find it really easy to write essays. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, I mean, that to me sounds crazy because that's inside out. Like mm. surely going for the run is the easy bit. Sitting down, studying. That's the hard bit, isn't it? Yes. Um, so, so I think we all have this common mechanism and we're all somewhere along a scale mm. yeah. from, you know, barely do this to... It's, it's a real battle, daily battle. Uh, but what makes it different is that we play out this mechanism in different contexts of our life. Mm. And presumably for different reasons as well then. Absolutely. So now we're starting to get into what's sitting beneath procrastination. Yeah. Because procrastination is a self-sabotage mechanism. Yes. Yes, this word, this phrase, self-sabotage, really mm. resonates with me. It comes up so many times in conversations with, with people, actions that they've done that have ultimately self-sabotaged themselves. Absolutely. And self-sabotage can... We, we can procrastinate. We can get caught in perfectionism. That's one way we can self-sabotage ourselves because if we're trying to make everything perfect, we don't tend to complete a lot. We tend to miss deadlines when we do finally do it's rushed um so perfectionism is a self-sabotage mechanism are you pointing at me kate stop it (laughs) um some people deliberately make a mess of things they'll actually do something badly right so there's loads of ways that self-sabotage can come out but you know procrastination is one of the really common ones that we come across and what sits beneath it is if we start to chunk down the level there's, there's lots of things at play. So first of all, humans, by our evolution, are primed to take the minimum effort. Mm. When we lived in caves, yeah. you didn't go and run for fun. You <laughs> saved your energy for when there were antelope outside. Mm. Sure. Okay. We, we didn't waste our energy. We didn't know um, whether we'd always have enough fuel, enough food. So you conserved your energy for the things that you really needed. Now we're talking there about physical energy, uh-huh. but it's the same with our mental energy. Our brains use a tremendous amount of calories. I forgot what the stat is, but it's quite, quite staggering. Yeah. Um, so we have this sort of primeval uh, programming that kind of is a sort of predisposes us to do the minimum. Mm. Yeah. So that, that's one of the things that's sort of at play underneath procrastination. The other things that we often get caught up in are fear of failure. Yes. So if we don't do the thing, we can't fail exactly. at it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It can be really paralysing that, can't it, actually? That kind of, you get to that point, because I find in my own life, I'm, I'm good at getting all the pieces in the right position. And then when there's that moment of actually having to finally act out that final play, that's when I freeze. And I'm sure it ties into this whole fear of failure, fear of it actually not working. Absolutely. Conversely... I find as many clients have a problem with fear of success Ah. as fear of failure. Oh, that's interesting. So how does that work then? So 
when we fear success, there's often something underlying around whether we feel we're good enough, whether we think we deserve to stand out, whether we think we're worthy of success. And sometimes this can come from quite benign things in our childhood, where somebody maybe put us down or, or said, well, you can't do that. You know, you're yeah, only six. Yeah. Um, and, and we code that as this sort of idea that we can't have success. Because also it yeah. could lead to change, right? It could lead to you moving up out of your comfy position at work or absolutely suddenly being suddenly suddenly having more responsibility or in a more competitive field or yeah indeed so so when we when we succeed uh we often have to step up yeah we have to make some effort uh if we go for a promotion and we put in all that effort and we tackle our self-sabotage and all our doubting thoughts and we go over our procrastination actually get the get the application in and create the presentation for the interview and get the job and then we find ourselves in the job and we're suddenly thinking oh my god I've now got to keep this up yeah Yeah. I've managed to talk myself into this situation I've now got the success I thought I wanted but now I've got to maintain it yeah And, and again this is all coming back to this feeling of you know do I deserve it am I good enough So all these things are underlying, they're kind of the bedrock of our procrastinating behaviour. Is that right? Okay. So what what can we do then? Because it's it behaviour change is hard, isn't it? It is. It is. So um and that's what I mean about the difference between managing procrastination and dealing with the underlying stuff, because behaviour change is management. So there's lots of things we can do to manage procrastination. You can find a way to set external deadlines I mean I'm part of a a, a group of other coaches and on a Monday morning at 7 30 a.m we get on a zoom call and hold ourselves accountable for what we're going to do for the week Ouch. so that is a mechanism that's set up yes 7 30 on a Monday it's a bold start to the week <laughs> <laughs> absolutely where you stick your neck out and you say right this week I'm going to do this and we all hold each other accountable so there are things that we can do like that that can create that external Um, motivation we can use time management tools we can use reminders we can time block um there are things like the pomodoro method where you have one of those (laughs) (laughs) tomato egg timers you know and you split your day into 15 minute chunks and see if you can manage to tie yourself to your laptop for 15 minutes so there's lots of practical tools around with procrastination but they are managing. Yeah, I'm sensing a but or a however coming up. Yeah, because because <laughs> if we if we haven't fixed the the root issues, right, we're not going to stick with any of those things because all those things you were just mentioning, I was like, me and Kate, we've met, we've talked about all of those things, and we've all, I definitely have tried them all for at least two days oh, yeah. before I <laughs> uh, totally forget about them and just go back to my old habits. So, so how do we identify? like what our root issue is whether it's the fear of failure the fear of success or um that we're just (laughs) bone idle (laughs) (laughs) just bone idle and actually I am lazy is a really common fear a lot of people are walking around with this underlying fear that they believe that they are lazy ah okay so that's a belief that they carry with them right as opposed to a fact yes and I talk a lot about beliefs because Things we believe we treat as if they are fact. We hold them in our head as if they are an absolute fact and they very rarely stand up to scrutiny. And if they are unhelpful and disempowering, the chances are they won't stand up to scrutiny. So I am lazy is one of those ones. And again, most of us can recognise maybe at some point, probably at school when we're little, being told you're lazy, you know, do your homework, do this, do that. Yeah, it's, it's not our stuff. A lot of our limiting beliefs we've kind of picked up from other people mm-hmm. and from situations, often with a child's understanding of the world, yeah. um, and we've applied it to ourselves. Uh, and one of the wonderful things that we do as humans automatically is we prove ourselves right. Yes, all day long. When we form a view of ourselves as lazy or even as simple as, well, I'm a procrastinator. Yeah. You know, that's wearing it at identity level, that's saying, I am a procrastinator. Uh, yeah. So we will then create situations where we procrastinate to prove ourselves right. Oh, look, I've done it again. I'm still a procrastinator. <sighs> yeah. It's fascinating. I'm laughing because it's so true. I know. It really is. This whole self fulfilling prophecy that, you know, and it's something I think about and that I'm aware of, yet I still, I still don't 
stop doing it. So how do we stop? Yeah, how do we, how do we identify what our underlying issue is? It really comes down to a series of questions to ask ourselves. And um, I think we've got the opportunity to share some resources afterwards. So I'm, I've got a, a, a thing with these questions on. So if anybody wants to work through them as a worksheet, I can provide that for you. So the first thing is, what am I sabotaging and how? So just getting that awareness Say I was writing an article and procrastinating about that. What is it I'm actually trying to sabotage? Okay. Well, it's writing the article. But what I'm really trying to sabotage is me being out there so that people can read my stuff and maybe want to work with me. Okay. So I'm actually sabotaging my business, which means I'm sabotaging mm. me because I kind of am my business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's getting into yeah. that. What actually am I sabotaging? Am I sabotaging a promotion? Am I sabotaging how people will see me, how people respect me? Am I sabotaging my health? So what really is it that you're kind of mucking up right. with this pattern of avoidance and procrastination and pushing it away and doing everything but the thing that would take you there? What actually is it that you're sabotaging? Okay. So if you're sort of avoiding, just thinking about things in everyday life, the things that I find myself procrastinating about, making a difficult phone call or doing that thing on the to-do list that I don't, I can't work out why I don't want to do it, but I don't want to do it. It's those type yeah. of things, yeah. Yeah, and that's, you've said it, I don't know why I don't want to do it, but I don't want to do it. Yeah. It's getting below that. Why? Mm, why don't? What are you sabotaging by repeating this pattern of procrastination? Okay. Can I just pick up on you said sabotaging how people see me? What does that mean? So sometimes uh, people will hide because they don't want people to see them. Mm. Sometimes they'll behave in a particular way because they think that's what people want to see. Sometimes it's about um, not being comfortable with who you are. Yeah. So, right. so we, can, we can sort of try and basically anything where we're trying to manipulate how people see us. Mm. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, or I guess actions that make you feel vulnerable. Yes, kind of absolutely. Your your example of the article, you know, that's making yourself vulnerable because you're putting your name out there and your yeah. thoughts out there, or open, yeah. opening up to someone in your life. I guess that that makes you vulnerable, doesn't it? That emotional absolutely. openness. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So you know what you're trying to sabotage? We're trying to sabotage opening up that vulnerability. Yeah. And if you keep procrastinating, you'll be successful at sabotaging it. Yeah, well done. And you. the conversation <laughs> won't happen, <laughs> yeah. and you'll stay safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most sabotage yeah. is about keeping ourselves safe. Yes. Because the things we yeah. talked about earlier were all fears. Fear of failure, fear of success, fear of not being enough, not being worthy, fear of having to keep it up, fear of having to do some effort. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's all about keeping ourselves safe. Yeah. So, so it's getting really clear on what is it I'm sabotaging and seeing sabotage as a mechanism you're doing, not seeing it as good or bad, just what is it that by procrastinating on this, I am stopping something happening? Right. Sometimes I lie awake and I think about my fridge Making all its noises downstairs How does it make things cold? How does it stop my food from getting old? How does it work? How does it work? The next question to ask yourself is what bad result would I get if I'm successful? Following on from your example then of writing an article or a blog or something that someone might want to write, mm -hmm. if that's successful, people really enjoy it. The bad mm -hmm. result of that is they might ask you to write another one. Yeah, or yes. they might really hate it and they might give me negative feedback. Yeah. And they might never want to read anything from me again. They might, they might even say something negative about me on social media. Mm. So if I'm successful mm. in writing the article and publishing it, the bad things yeah. that could happen if I'm successful in doing this thing are I could come away feeling really like people hate me. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of you know, exaggerating yeah. this a bit, but th this is the way our unconscious minds work. Or even, or even worse, that there's no reaction. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Into the void. Put it out there, nobody <laughs> reads it. Yeah. Absolutely. So what bad result would I get if I am successful at doing this thing? Mm, okay. And then what bad result will I get if I'm not successful? 
Okay, so hang on. So if I don't manage to write the article, then what bad thing will happen? Mm. Okay. So I, yeah, I've just stayed in exactly the same place. I haven't expressed myself. I haven't gained any new contacts or audience or respect, etc. Absolutely. All of that. Yeah. Whichever lens you put on, a bad result is something you want to avoid, right? Yeah. Yes. And we avoid bad results to keep ourselves safe. Yes. Mm. So the next thing to consider is how am I then keeping myself safe? So you're keeping yourself safe by putting up a bit of a force field around you and not yeah. interacting with... And staying in, in staying in your comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the, you know, I'm, I'm also avoiding tumbleweed or, you know, bad comments on social media, all those other things that could happen. Or, you know, if it's, if it's a piece of work, a bad mark or a bad review or a project failing or going to the interview but not getting the job. Um, so we're keeping ourselves safe from all those things. Yeah. Mm. And when we put that frame of safety onto it, we can, we can kind of get a bit of forgiveness for ourselves. It allows us to move from berating ourselves because we're not doing the thing mm. to being more forgiving about, I'm actually just trying to keep myself safe here. So it's making a s- it's, easy passage for ourselves through Yeah, that. because the thing with procrastination is it feels so heavy when you're in it. Yeah. Mm. When we get that frame of actually all I'm doing is trying to keep myself safe some from some bad stuff that could happen either way, most of which is in my imagination. Yeah. Mm. Then we can start to shift to that. It kind of takes some of the weight off it. The dark playground gets less dark. Right. Mm. And we're shifting our energy from that attacking ourselves to that little bit of compassion. I was just going to say, so this is a good thing. We, we want to bring that compassion yes. in. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. This is this reminds this reminds me of when I was taught about the ego and that a lot of um, yeah a lot of like our self doubt and our self our negative self belief and us telling ourselves that we can't do things is our ego trying to protect us and that's exactly, exactly. This, isn't it it's just trying to protect us and when you when you see it in that light and 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 this person who I was having a um, a session with she taught me give your ego a name and I call my my ego Bob <laughs> Bob and she's like. <laughs> And so it's like, instead of being like, oh, fuck off, Bob, in that moment, you're like, thank you, Bob. And so, you've, you, so you're grateful yes. in that moment. Yeah. And you're Absolutely. kind of like, thank you, Bob. I don't need you right now. And, and then Bob can, Bob's like, all right, well, I've tried. Yeah. And Bob can go off. Yeah. And so that's what, it, that's what this is then, isn't it? It's the same thing. Absolutely. How interesting. I mean, our unconscious mm. mind is primed to keep us safe. Bob, or our unconscious mind or our ego, whatever you want to call it, is desperately trying to keep us safe. And again, back to the caveman analogy, safe means away from harm, fed, watered, esteem intact, cocooned in the cave, in our, in our comfort zone. So, so yeah. it's kind of what, we, what we're doing is we're starting to loosen off the our whole idea that what's behind this is some, some fear is some bad stuff happening. Yeah. And that actually, this is a natural protective mechanism to try and keep us safe. And yet the things we're trying to keep ourselves safe from are keeping us stuck. Right. Because those things aren't scary saber-toothed tigers or mammoths. No. So if it's all about keeping us safe, what better mechanisms are there to keep us safe? So now we're starting to engage the more creative part of our mind. So we've, we've moved from this point where, first of all, we're attacking ourselves and we're not sure why. We've now got some, some idea of what it is we're sabotaging. We're starting to understand that there are some genuine bad things we think might happen if we're successful and also if we're not successful. That our, our brain is desperately trying to protect us in some way and keep us safe. Now it's time to move into the more creative part of our thinking and think, well, actually, if the game plan here is to keep us safe from harm but perhaps still achieve the thing we want to achieve what other mechanisms are mechanisms are there that would be better at keeping us safe so if i'm going to write an article and put it out there into the world for example yeah. what mechanisms could i employ that could help me do that that will make it feel safe enough for me to get out of the dark playground and actually sit down and start writing so, so it might be, you know, getting somebody to proofread things, testing it. Right. Taking some smaller action that gives you a bit of evidence, the contrary. Because at the moment, your brain is still trying to prove you right. 
Mm. You know, it's still trying to prove to you that, well, I'm a terrible writer. I've always wanted to write, but I might be terrible at it. People might not like it. People might think it's shit. I was going to say a classic example of this that relates to both Gwen and I is when we first launched this podcast. I was really nervous before we put the first episode out and it was only sharing it before we launched it with some real trusted people, some friends who listened to it and said, we love it. Then that was like a weight lifted off my shoulders. And then I suddenly felt from being scared, I felt excited. Yeah. So you've gone for that. The thing that would make it safe is releasing it to a small select group first. You then get that feedback and then that starts to basically collapse this idea that if I do this, there'll be a bad result and people will hate what I've written or hate my podcast, Mm. won't listen, tumbleweed, you know. Mm. So so it's how can... Effectively, what we're doing is we're marshalling our resources and we're also marshalling resources outside of ourselves. So a lot of the reason why we get stuck into procrastination is because we're stuck in our own head. Mm. And we've lost sight of what's outside us and what resources and people are around to help us. Yeah. But even if you don't have people around you, I mean, you can outsource, you can get a VA involved. There's so many things that you can do. Or, you know, it might be it's more of a sort of personal private action, like practicing something first. Mm. Yeah. You know, so, so it's how can I make this safer so it feels safe enough I can take action? Yeah. What about those more domestic things that don't necessarily have a perceived negative outcome? You know, those sort of long list of slightly boring things that we know we've got to do and that we never quite get round to. What about those kind of acts? What, like something like, I don't know, a DIY job or something? Yeah, for example, yeah. The ironing? The ironing, I don't do ironing. I don't believe that modern materials need ironing. But... <laughs> I don't own an iron. <laughs> Ban the iron! <laughs> but yeah, for oh, argument's dear. sake, the ironing, for all those ironers out there. So it might be, I mean, if it's something like that, if you've got through the questions of what bad result will, get, will I get if I'm successful and what bad result will I get if I'm not successful... That may be enough with something that yes. practical. Yes, yeah, okay, fair enough. We don't need to go so deep. Because what, mm. what, it, what that does on its own is show that actually, if there is a fear here, it's, a, it's, it's yeah. ridiculous. But I'm going to talk about my fridge freezer. Oh, please, please do. So the only thing holding my freezer door shut at the moment is a toolbox. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I've been avoiding this whole thing that several months ago, maybe four or five months ago. Um, one of the hinges on my freezer door, and it's an integral freezer, uh, one of the hinges, the sort of plastic mechanism inside of it sort of disintegrated. And ever since, I've had to wedge the door closed, otherwise the freezer door just opens on its own. And I've bought mm. a new hinge, and I've tried to fit it once, and it didn't quite close properly. And I'm not sure, even though this is quite a practical job, and I'm a pretty practical woman, I was I was bought tools when I was 18 my dad was an engineer I pride myself in my ability to fix most things around the house I have left the freezer door I mean literally it's just a I mean I've taken the front panel off (laughs) and there's now I have a black kitchen with this white freezer door with a toolbox in front of it I love it it's a good look (laughs) so that's that's just like it's like if you just do it just sort it it's just a bit of it's just a job it's just a household chore Underneath that, though, there's a very real fear. Bear in mind that I am the daughter of an engineer. That if I can't change a hinge on a freezer door, that means I'm not good enough. Yeah. It means I'm not my father's daughter, actually. Yeah. So Mm. even some of these kind of fairly mundane, you know, sounds trivial things that we avoid around the house can have a much heavier route to them. Yes. And a massive that's backstory. really yeah. interesting yeah mm. that it's it's easy to be dismissive of these these menial tasks but actually there's there's more to it sometimes yeah 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 i mean sometimes you know some diy jobs are actually dangerous you know yeah. the, the the what bad thing that could happen might be electrocuting sure. yourself <laughs> and then the, f- okay. the fear is real um and your ego is doing a good job exactly <laughs> well done, ego. thank it <laughs> most heartedly for keeping it safe so so it's, so this is why this going down the questions is so important because we do trivialize things on the surface level we say it's just a freezer door it's mm. just a hinge i'll do it some other day yeah but actually hanging off that is a genuine, for, for, in this example, is a genuine fear that I am somehow dishonouring, you know, my dad isn't with us anymore, mm. 
that I'm somehow dishonouring him by not being his daughter and being a wizard at anything mechanical. Yeah. Yes. Crazy, isn't it? And and so is is the process of writing the answers to these questions and kind of, um, you know, exploring the potential reasons and kind of and, and educating yourself and, mm-hmm. and having like some eureka moments. Yeah. And kind of going, oh, I see why I'm not doing this. Is that enough? Like, is it the is it the process? Is it the process of shining a light on it? Is that enough to kind of to fix it? Often it is. Right. But right. when we get to this point where we, we've recognised and sort of thanked ourselves for keeping ourselves safe, it's moving, it's now moving into action. So what action could I take that would yeah. make it safe for me to do this thing? Which is better than keeping myself safe by procrastinating. Okay. Mm. Okay, so for me, that might be asking for help and actually getting somebody, maybe not in lockdown, but somebody to hold the freezer door, who's a bit handy (laughs) to help me do this, right? Yeah. Single-handedly changing hinges on freezer doors is quite tricky anyway. Um, So it's moving to that place where we get into action. Okay. The other frame that's really useful is a lot of our roots around procrastination come from other people telling us to do things parents telling us to do things teachers telling us to do things bosses telling us to do things partners telling us to do things so a lot of our sort of attachment to procrastination comes from that sort of external being told to do something Mm -hmm. and a little bit of a rebel Mm. thing going on yeah so the other really fantastic thing to help dissolve that is to realize this is for me. I'm mm. doing this for me. I'm not doing this for someone else. I'm doing this for me. And this brings uh, a much lighter sense of choice into something. Because rather than feeling like we have to do something because we've been told to. Yeah. Rather than that sort of external sort of teacher, child, parent, mm. child type relationship. We can get into actually everything I do in my life is for me. Yeah. If I'm happy to stay the way I am and not get fit, fine. But actually, I'm. I would be going out to exercise for me. I wouldn't be. Go, I wouldn't be taking exercise because Joe Wick says I should. Mm. You know, I'll be, I'll be mm. exercising for me. And when we drop into that, how is this for me? Yeah. It becomes a bit more like, oh yeah. Mm. Why am I standing in my own way then? You know, if I'm writing an article, am I doing it for my... No, I'm doing it for me, actually, ultimately. I mean, obviously, I'm writing for my... You know, for people who will read it and hopefully find it helpful. Um, But also, there is... You know, it's not... Very little in our lives is purely altruistic. Yes. I wonder if multitasking is a form of procrastination, because I often find... We talk about multitasking a lot, me and Kate, and because I'm working on various projects, and I'm often trying to work on all of them at the same time while watching telly, and so everything <laughs> everything takes <laughs> twice as long, and I don't get them done, and I'm like, ah, if I'd have just yes. sat there and just focused on one of them, then that little job would be done right now. Yeah. But no, and I've I've spent the entire evening on my laptop when I could have turned it off two hours ago. And is that another form of procrastination, do you think? I, I think it is. And as you're talking about, the, the other one that springs to mind is new shiny thing syndrome. Yes. Oh. yes. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> when, you know, the, the, you've already got loads of things you're procrastinating about, but then, oh, that's a new thing. Yes. <laughs> you know? right. And you run after that. And then there's another thing on your plate and another thing. So all you're doing is proving yourself right, that I can't do this because I've got too many things on. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, okay. Too many things on. So yeah, saying yes a... to extraneous tasks. Yeah. What I find myself doing is I'll spend an hour walking around the house going, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I don't have time to do all the things I need to do. And if, I, exactly. if rather than walking around the house talking about how busy I was, I just cracked on, it might be yeah. different. I mean, it seems so simple. I think that's, that's the thing with a lot of these things. It's far more simple than we think. We think that it is just a trait, like you're saying. I think... I am a procrastinator. That's the way I was born. Oh, well. Um, But actually, yeah, when you look at it, 
it can be really simple and, and I've done that before like with Byron Katie you know her yes. four her four tools the process of sitting there and writing stuff out oh my god like you learn so much in that process the human brain loves to get into repeatable repeatable efficient patterns mm. so when procrastination has become our what our brain thinks is a, an efficient repeatable pattern <laughs> it's efficiently making sure we don't do things day after day after day very repeatable very efficient works really well um then it's about disrupting that thinking pattern mm. so what any kind of journaling question-based inquiry does or, or with a coach equally is it starts to disrupt those automatic thinking patterns it starts to destabilize them and shake them up a bit and then we start to go hang on a moment it's not just that i'm a procrastinator there's something bigger hanging off this yeah. and actually i you know when i when i know what it is i'm scared of i can create safety to create action so in theory you can train your brain to never procrastinate again um that's bold is that Kate, true? that's bold <laughs> that is bold. the everest um, of procrastination <laughs> But the more we practice loosening off the procrastination, having that dialogue with ourselves, with Bob mm -hmm. or whoever it is, to understand what is sitting underneath it, are okay. And we become practiced at that dialogue and then we move ourselves to action quicker. Yeah. So how are you sabotaging yourself? <laughs> yes. What's the bad result if you do it? What's the bad result if you don't do yes. it? Yes. How are you protecting yourself? How can you create a better protection mechanism or something that makes you feel safe enough to take some action? How do you, you know, how is this for you? Yeah. For yeah. me. I'm doing this for me. Thank you so much to Fiona for that really interesting conversation. And Fiona's really kindly provided us with a page that just outlines the questions that she's gone through with Gwen and I and a few exercises that you can do to help you think about what those underlying reasons are behind your procrastination. So go to the show notes and you'll be able to see the link to that page. And you'll also see the link to Fiona's website if you want to find out more about her. That was absolutely brilliant. And I don't know about you, Kate, but I was literally all the way through going, oh, my God, that's me. Oh, my God, that's me. Completely, completely. And I was thinking, God, if I'd had this conversation with her 10 years ago, <laughs> yes. I wonder if there would have been any differences in my life choices. Yeah. So anyway, she gave us some really interesting, some really simple but hopefully effective exercises in getting to the root of where our procrastination is coming from. How did you do with that, Kate? Yes. So I found this really interesting because there's a particular project for my master's, actually, that I'm working on right now. And there is a bit of audio that I'm supposed to be editing. I recorded this bit of audio about two weeks ago. I haven't been able to make myself sit down and listen to it. Ooh. And exactly as you're saying, the procrastination monkey, I've done all sorts of other little things. I've done all, you know, I've been, it's not that I've been sitting there filing my nails. I've been doing stuff. But each day I start the day thinking, right, I'm going to edit that bit of audio and I never quite get round of it. So I was like, right, this is going to be a good example to try and use with this series of questions she gave us. And I was trying to think why I've not been doing it. Anyway, so I started off thinking, OK, so this bit of audio, um, audio I want to edit. If I don't edit it, what's going to happen? And what's going to happen is I'm going to rock up to my seminar next week having to say to the tutor, I've not done it. Mm. It also means that I'll never get to find out if it was good or if it wasn't good, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I've realised what I'm doing by not editing it is that I'm not having to confront that question, that fear that what if it's, A, what if it's not good enough? And B, what if I'm not good enough to edit it into the way I want it to sound mm. afterwards? So it's ultimately, yeah, fear of failure. I suppose. And so in that scenario, is it almost preferable to just be like, oh, sorry, teach, I haven't done it. And her go, oh, oh, well, like, is that almost preferable yeah. to producing it and having it judged? It's almost easier. And that's a really good point, that judgment thing. And that comes into a lot of the things that I procrastinate over, I think, that fear of putting something out there and it being 
judged as not good enough or even just even if it's not judged as not good enough it just means pe- means I'm in the spotlight that people are paying attention to me yeah. which can feel quite scary which is a crazy thing for someone who's a podcast host <laughs> I to, was say, just about to say and who, who, who <laughs> too late puts love himself out there I know it's out there <laughs> But that is something that does stop me from finishing quite a lot of projects, Mm. which is strange, isn't it? Mm. How about the question where you ask yourself how to make it safer for you? Did you come up with answers that will help you move through it? Yes. And the thing I kept coming back to is the thing that will make it feel safe, because by me listening to it, no one else is listening to it. So actually just listening to it. Because you haven't even listened to it yet. Because I haven't even listened to it. And so me listening to it isn't going to, doesn't mean I've got to let anyone else listen to it. Mm. It just means I get to know what is um, underneath the bed. Do you know what I mean? It's like the monster yeah. under the bed. If I, don't, if I don't listen to it, then I don't know. But if I do yeah. listen to it, I'll probably be quite reassured. And then I can ask for help. And what you could do, like she was saying about having somebody else proofread your article, you could send it to me because I yeah. listen to audio all day, or you, your brother, he's he's helped yeah. us by listening to our early episodes of the podcast. So you have yeah. people close to you, or maybe it's something, you know, you could have a, a buddy in your master's class where you listen to each other's, I don't know if these things work, but I guess that's the sort of thing she's saying, isn't it? Yes, completely. But actually, by sitting on it, and A, not listening to it, and B, not letting anyone else listen to it, it's it's making it feel bigger and scarier than it actually needs to be. Yeah, and it's wasting the yeah. work that you've done. What, yeah. about, what about you? Have you have you kind of well, had a look at that or think? Yeah. <laughs> interesting story on that, Kate. So, um, <laughs> what I found was I kept procrastinating on doing the procrastination <laughs> exercises because I was a bit like, <laughs> what thing in particular do I procrastinate on? And I, I was going from well. I can't think of any one thing in particular and then then settled on I procrastinate with absolutely everything in my life and spend <laughs> a lot of time in my dark playground. So I thought what would be really useful for me, <laughs> this is classic procrastination, is to watch a video on YouTube instead. But what I did was watch <laughs> Tim Urban's TED Talk and I realised I've seen it before. I think probably a lot of us have seen it before, but it's well worth going and seeing it again. It's called Inside the Mind of a Master Procrastinator. And again, so many, so many um, light bulb moments where you're like, yes, that's oh, me. Yeah. And um, yes. one of the really interesting things that he highlighted, the difference between is deadline procrastination and long-term procrastination. So I am 100% throughout every part of my world, my life, have always been a procrastinator up until deadline. And when I've got deadlines, I will get it done. And yeah. and I re- like you and I did this with the podcast. We worked on it for two yeah. years very yeah. slowly. And in the end, we were like, fuck it. We've just got to get it out there. And we needed deadlines. And then we've, we've managed to do it. There was no yeah. way we would have achieved this without releasing it and having the, dead, the fortnightly no. deadlines, which we've pretty much more or less kept to. So, that, so that's one thing. Oh, and I, I, I do yeah. realise also, I've realised this recently, when a client says to me they want the voiceover job by Wednesday, I go, OK, I'm going to record that Wednesday afternoon. And I'm slowly starting to realise that's not what they mean. They want it by <laughs> Wednesday. But still, I lock it in and I get it done. Um, so in a way, you're procrastination and being in the dark playground is short-lived on those tasks because you have deadlines you get so ultimately you have the thing that makes you get it done however long-term procrastination where you Mm -hmm. don't have deadlines and you've got maybe a dream of that thing that project that that career change or whatever people living with long-term procrastination can have long-term unhappiness and regret And that's where it's really, really key to get to the roots of it. Yeah. Um, He was saying, you know, just be really aware of that procrastination monkey and try and think of your life as a finite number of weeks and those kind of tricks and tools. But ultimately, ultimately, it's what she's saying, isn't it? You've got to get to the root of why you're not doing it. And the problem with long term procrastination is that you rather than not completing your dreams or your dream project people are not even starting them so um do you think that this is something that this tool that she gave us you know the asking the questions do you think this is something that you will use moving forwards 
I will definitely use this. I think this is really helpful just to um, put that extra bit of thought into why I am procrastinating about certain things rather than just glibly um, writing it off as, oh, ha, 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 I've just procrastinated. I don't want to do that. To actually think at that deeper level as to, well, why? And then to be able to now work through the process and get to the bottom of why rather than putting a quick fix on it, such as a timer or a list or all of those quick fix tools that she talked about. Which don't work. I would definitely. If you haven't fixed it. Which don't work or or maybe for some people, but for me, it's a short term solution. It doesn't really, you know, the same problem keeps reoccurring. Yeah. So I will 100% use this. I found it really useful, actually. Because the whole thing is moving you then into some kind of action. Exactly. That's it. The ultimate outcome of any task to help you deal with procrastination is to be able to actually act at the end yeah. of it, right? For the way my brain works, I just feel like it's, it's really helpful. It feels like a really kind of logical way to think about it, actually. Yeah. What about you, Gwen? Yeah, well, definitely. Like this kind of exploratory writing exercise really works for me. Um, I'm a big fan of Byron Katie. I don't know if you've heard of her. I mentioned her earlier. Um, yes. Right. OK. Yeah. So for listeners who have done her four questions or the work, uh, you will know this, that, that just the process of sitting down and taking the time to answer questions honestly and to go deep into it, it brings out all kinds of unexpected truths. Yeah. And I was a bit glib earlier about <laughs> procrastinating over the exercise. But I yeah. did, in fact, I did, in fact, sit down with a pen and a pad And I unearthed some really surprising truths that hadn't even crossed my mind before. And that basically they're quite personal and I'm still processing it, which is which is why I've not gone into it. But long story short, the reason I'm not exercising is because I'm trying to protect myself from having my heart broken. So, yeah, really interesting stuff. And in doing that, though, I am sabotaging my own health. Yes. So. I mean, honestly, this the the questions that she's got, the exercise is just mind blowing because I had no idea that this stuff was going on, you know, down below. Right. So f- so okay. for me, the process of shining a light on what's underneath or as she says, looking at the monster under the bed, that that process has been huge. And it has been enough to, like she says, disrupt my thought and behaviour patterns. Okay. Okay. And that's a really big thing, isn't it? Disrupting those thought patterns we get into. And so you feel like this is ultimately going to be way more useful to you achieving what it is you want to achieve. Way more useful than signing up to another incentive-based exercise class or buying another piece of shiny gym equipment yeah 100% because those things they would never they I'm set to fail because I've got my deep set core beliefs my subconscious is working against me so and yeah I don't fully understand the the next step which is how to create a better protection mechanism you know or something that helps you feel safe enough to take action like that I think this has been a big process that is a, a big step I'm still processing but the other way like she said, the other way to action is how is this for me? And yeah. the best thing for me is to protect my health, actually. Yes. And so now this new thought is embedded and is going to be underpinning my decisions. So do you know what? It's bloody massive. Wow. OK. Yeah. Well, isn't that fascinating? Because when we started at the beginning of this episode thinking, let's research about procrastination, let's talk about procrastination, I never thought that it would result in a um, deep experience like that. I thought we were going to be talking about um, self-management tools on a far more superficial level. Yeah, which is what you expect, which is what all these procrastination self-help things are about. Yeah. But they're set to fail. Yeah. Yeah. God damn it. God damn it. So we've we've got to dig deep. We gotta look at the monster under the bed. <laughs> but he's so scary. And then we could get shit done. <laughs> <laughs> you for listening to write up my podcast as always if you'd like to get in touch with us you can email us at write up my podcast at gmail.com or you can uh, get in touch with us via instagram or twitter and you can find us at write up my please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you are listening to us on and if you're on apple we would love it if you could give us a review and rate us five stars please thank you very much and 
of course, please share with your friends. You can also go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash write up my podcast. Um, and there you'll find some exclusive content for members only. And you can subscribe to that by paying um, a small fee, whatever you want. And that will enable you to access that content. And it'll also enable us to give a little something to our wonderfully talented team who help keep us running every week. Speaking of the wonderfully talented team, massive, massive thank you to everybody who helps us put this out. That's Andy T, a.k.a. Andy Turvey, our editor, Andrew Grimes on the music, Kat O'Brien, our content editor, and Erica Francis George, who does our beautiful artwork. And we will be back in a couple of weeks with our last episode of Series One. Hey, now, my dad, my dad was very sad to hear this. He was very shocked oh, was that he? we are going to take a was holiday. He? Yeah. Oh, wow. is your work? Daddy course? Watson doesn't think holidays are allowed <laughs> for the right up my <laughs> Just podcast. Just keep team. on. Plugging on. We're just going to have a little Christmas break. Oh, and actually, that reminds me, we're busy researching ideas for Series 2. So extra special shout out for any ideas that you've got, things that you're into, things that friends or family are into, or just something that you've heard about that you'd like to know more. Tell us about it because it might end up being an episode for Series 2. And of course, a massive, massive thank you to you, the listener. Without you, this would be an entirely pointless exercise. No, we are very, very grateful for you so until we meet again keep doing things to make you feel good bye bye tell me did you like the podcast brian no oh you've on like brian you thought our podcast was really great then don't hold back like subscribe and tell your mate but if like brian you thought our podcast wasn't fun then just keep quiet don't feel the need to tell anyone oh we'd love to hear from you if you've got some thoughts to share such rich and lovely views that all should be aware of but i hope you liked our podcast and you thought it was really great and if you did like subscribe and tell your mate Cause we don't need grumpy pants bringing everybody down No, we don't need negative Nellies making people frown No So I hope you liked our podcast and you thought it was really great And if you did, like, subscribe and tell your mate